let's get started. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. My name is Travis Corbett. I'm a business development manager at Canon Business Services. Um, Adrian, uh, who's on the call today, he will be presenting. He's the head of our pre-sales department. Uh, Diego, our security practice lead, will be here to answer any questions at the end. So due to the increasing number of cyber events, securing your environment is now more important than ever. Today, we're going to provide a security checklist with the key areas of focus for organisations of all sizes. If you have any questions during the webinar, can you please post them in the chat? We will review and answer these towards the end. If you would like to follow the checklist as displayed on the screen um, or, or bookmark it for later, uh, please follow the link in, that I'm about to post in the chat. Uh, so without any further ado, I will hand over to Adrian. Awesome, thanks Travis, um, and welcome everybody to uh, our session webinar today around IT security checklist. Um, before I get started and go through the agenda, I just wanted to do a bit of a quick recap of 2022 and where we are in 2023. Uh, so with 2023 already upon us, you know, IT and cybersecurity must be a huge focus for all organizations. Uh, if you aren't yet convinced of how devastating an attack uh, can be, just look at you know, the extensive list of notable breaches that occurred in 2022, uh, you know, from Optus, Medibank, Bunnings to Telstra. Uh, no company can truly say, you know, that they aren't at risk of an attack given the way cybersecurity threats have evolved. Um, one of the most important things also to note, you know, as part of this presentation that, you know, uh, not, all not all cybersecurity, not all organizations are equal. Everyone has a different risk profile. For example, you know, the types of sensitive data that organizations are collecting and storing can vary wild, wildly, you know, depending on the business and even the industry. Uh, so while that's important, you know, not all cybersecurity in general is equal for every business. We've developed the IT security checklist, you know, which has been developed to help strengthen your systems, you know, as we continue through to 2023 uh, and to avoid becoming, you know, this year's big news headline, which I'm sure everyone wants to avoid. Uh, so what I'm going to do is take you through this agenda, which is really about, you know, know your environment, manage your technology and people, um, and then, you know, moving on to monitoring your progress. Um, so there's pretty key three areas there that we try to simplify this checklist, you know, down just to help you along that journey. Um, and wherever you see that this might help you, you know, hope this can be of use um, to yourselves. Um, just a quick Snapshot of 2022, this is just the, what the ACSC saw in 2022. Um, so we saw, a, you know, an increase in financial losses due to the business email compromise, um, which was over $98 million worth, <clears throat> which was basically an average of 64,000 per report, right, which is huge. It's still business email compromise, you know, you know, is that much value in cybercrime? <clears throat> the, the average cost per cybercrime uh, report also was over 39,000 for small businesses, 88,000 for medium and 62,000 for large enterprise. So you can see that they're not really, you know, they don't really, you know, they're focusing on all areas, small, medium and large, right? They're, it's not just one particular, you know, industry, um, which has also showed an increase of 14%, an average increase of 14%. Uh, there was a 25% increase in the number of publicly reported software vulnerabilities. Uh, there was another 30% increase in previous year of just cyber crime reports, you know, which is over 76,000 last year, right? So these are some damning facts that just show, you know, that there's an ever increasing, you know, threat. There's basically a lot more targeted um, attacks that's happening. And we see that 2023 is going to be no different than last year. We're going to probably see the same upward trajectory. Um, so that's why we kind of, you know, look to put this together, help our customers. We're having these conversations on a daily basis with our customers. So uh, I'll look to take you through it. And uh, as Travis mentioned as well, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to pop them in the chat um, and we'll look to address them at the end of the session. Right, so the first part, the first part of the, um, the checklist, which is know your environment. Uh, it's all around documentation. Right, so to build a strong security program, you need to understand the environment that you're working in. Uh, that's why it's important to begin by assessing your environment, documenting 
all of the following um, areas, assets or elements. Um, but it's probably no surprise to most people that, you know, documentation, you need to have documentation so you know what you're doing. Uh, but these are some of the areas like documenting your employees, including any established privilege levels. Contractors, what are they accessing? How are they accessing your systems and applications? External or guest users, how are they getting access to your information? Uh, you know, your networks, your servers, your applications, it seems pretty basic. Uh, but why this is important? Well, we see time and time again when we're having conversations and we ask customers, hey, can you give us the latest documentation so that we can you know, do this piece of work or do this assessment? And we always get a very similar answer on a, you know, for the majority. It's not really up to date or we don't really have it or we're going to give us some time and we'll update it and send it to you. So it's, it's pretty clear that most organizations don't have this as a priority um, within their business to date, right? But it's super important because you need to know your assets, your information and all the elements of your environment. So Adrian, just on that, in the event of a breach, uh, if the documentation isn't up to date, how does, how does this impact the events that follow? Yes, yeah, so good question. So it's very important. So it's it's probably one of the most fundamental things. If you don't know about your assets or all your information, then it's just going to make it that much harder to try and troubleshoot in the event of a cyber attack. Um, and then that flows on to the remediation as well, because maybe not everybody's in sync with what's what's in the environment, how people are accessing the environment. So it's, it's going to be very hard to try and you know resolve that cyber attack quickly. Right. So it's going to cause a lot more delays. And stress. I hope that answered the question. Certainly did. Awesome. Um, then basically we're moving on from just the standard document documenting the environment. So what's there? We need to move on to this. Yeah, depending on your situation, you know, it's also a good idea to start to document how these assets and elements interact with each other, right? Identify any potential weaknesses in assets interactions that allow users to greater access than is required. Right, so those two there, is, it's super important. Like, how does application A talk to application B, C, D, right? Or how does system A talk to application B, right? What are the protocols that are used and what are the permissions that are required to, to access those systems, right? It's super important because that, again, will help to identify where your potential weaknesses are, uh, where you need to improve security, or in the event of a cyber attack, how you can troubleshoot and remediate quickly. Um, the next two points are probably one of the most important in this in this section, which is around ensuring that you have a process that for regularly updating the documentation. So that's almost like setting some time with a various individual or whether the responsibility is with an individual, a role within the business or a department. Basically setting aside, aside some time uh, to actually keep documentation updated at all times. And we all get stuck in sometimes the day-to-day -day operational aspects of of our roles, um, but documentation is so important, especially in this cybersecurity landscape and where we are, that if you don't have that updated at all times, it's actually going to cost you a lot more money potentially in the in the in the future if, in the event of attack. So summarizing all that, ensure you have very good documentation at all times, um, and ensure you have a person, role, or department responsible for updating your documentation. Moving on, so your technology, so managing your technology. So now we know about the documentation, we've got the doco, that's all great. Um, you know, when it comes to managing the security of your technology, make sure you can address each and every one of these items on the list, right? These are items on this list that should be actioned uh, immediately either on your own within your own teams, or if you don't have the capacity to do it, look to reach out to a partner to help you do these. And these aren't, you know, uh, anything that most of you are probably already aware of or know about, uh, but it's a bit of a list to say these are the super important items. Uh, I've highlighted a couple on here just to touch on, because I don't want to touch on every single dot point here. Um, but there's some easy, you know, basic ones. You know, our backups are disconnected from the network to ensure that the data is, you know, restored and easily Restored easily and securely, right? The, the amount of times we see the backups are stored on the same network as the servers, the infrastructure, desktops, et cetera, and then exposed to cyber attacks, you know, it's, it's probably happening far too often. Um, and there's simply, you know, there's simple solutions to address that. 
where appropriate, you know, the data is properly encrypted and stored securely, right? Especially if you're in a cloud uh, platform like maybe Azure or AWS, most of those things are just tick boxes to encrypt your data uh, within that platform. Right? Simple things that can be turned on and just be addressed quite quite easily. Um, you know, have multi-factor turned on, multi-factor authentication for your identities, right? Again, simple, you know, enabling of services where most companies have a, an Office 365 or an M365 solution in place. Uh, these are just, in most cases, part of the existing bundles and services that you have, but they should be turned on, right, as a matter of absolute, you know, priority. Uh, and then coupled with that, using you know privileged access management controls or rollbacks access controls um, and conditional access to basically limit unnecessary access to the environment, right? Limit the exposure that if there was an account to be compromised, that they only have a very set amount of infrastructure or app access to apps within that platform, right? These are just key ones, uh, just simple ones that we just say, you know, we always take customers through and go, we need to tick these ones off immediately. Right, to really improve your security posture. Add some additional ones uh, on the list, which are uh, based on the whole work from home and the whole concept, which is you know well and truly here to stay. You know, we have seen a lot of organisations uh, look to adopt the BYOD policy, or it's kind of been forced or pushed onto them, where users just access, use their own machines at home, right, to access corporate networks, and there was no real policy or you know, conditional access policies that prevented that from happening. And it's still in place in a lot of businesses today. Uh, that just opens and it opens up the attack surface uh, on that environment. It opens the attack surface on that personal home computer as well as on the corporate network, right? So exposing potential sensitive data um, or exposing it potential whole networks uh, back onto that home user's uh, personal computer, for example. So ensuring there's a, a proper BYOD policy that encompasses the security of identity, device management, and so forth, will drastically improve uh, the security posture there. Um, and the next two points are really important as well. These are probably the two most important that I generally see as you know critical. So you have technology that provides end-to-end -end visibility across networks, applications, users, and data. Right. So do you have the visibility that to see what are the vulnerabilities or uh, you know issues or you know any potential threats that could be happening on your network or yeah within your applications users and data um, and that also flows on to the next one that i've highlighted which is around you know do you have the technology to identify anomalies generate necessary alerts and take the necessary action right to prevent breaches what those two there are really talking about our vulnerability management type service where you know you have either some sort of scanning process or you have a tool that's scanning your network and your environment to look at vulnerabilities. So you can have a bit of a you know quick view of what are my high or critical high, medium, low um, issues and vulnerabilities in my network. So you can take, you know, you can start to prioritize what to address. Um, and the last one is around uh, you know, having basically a system or a solution in place, such as like a seam type solution where it will detect the anomaly that you can set up uh, a learning, obviously, and then set up some necessary, uh, maybe potential automation in there to take necessary steps. An example might be an, an identity or an account is potentially being compromised, and there's an alert that's been raised that, hey, this account's been trying to log on to you know, this particular application 30 times in the last five seconds or something like that, which is a signal of some sort of strange activity. You can set up automation to go in and disable that user's account. And that is to try and prevent a breach from occurring in the first place. Um, so those are two things there. Know what vulnerabilities are in your environment and have the technology, have the technology to be able to detect anomalies and respond quickly to prevent breaches. <clears throat> so let's talk about the technology. You can't have technology without talking about the people that use that technology. So you know, your systems are only as secure as the people working within them, right? So in addition to securing your technology, you need to invest in educating all of the company users on proper security behaviors, right? These are just some points here that we've got highlighted, which show, you know, some of the key things that you need to be looking at from a user perspective or a people perspective, right? 
is there an established process for revoking access for terminated users? Like, I've seen that a number of times where, yeah, they say, yeah, yeah the guy let us know, then the HR department tells us, and then, you know, all these people get involved to disable. All of a sudden, that user account stays dormant for weeks, months, you know, with full access, right? So if that was to get compromised, no one would even know that that's happened potentially, right, for, for an extended period of time. Um, have you educated board members? you know, on security responsibilities and report to them regularly. <clears throat> Super important, right? And the board needs to understand that they are, you know, very much accountable for the security posture within uh, across your business. You know, they need to understand what the risks are and how and what the plan is to look to remediate them. Um, is there a training, you know, an awareness training around cybersecurity behaviours that's in place? You know, that, that's occurring regularly every three to six months. This one's probably the most important. I always tell customers, if you don't have something in place, we need to get something in place now because generally speaking, your people are your first line of defense against most cyber attacks. If you can prevent users from doing silly things or clicking on you know, suspicious emails or going to dodgy websites and clicking on it and not being aware, right? that's where you could probably stop the majority of the potential cyber attacks and breaches. Um, so it's super important there to get something in place. And there's plenty of training and you know awareness uh, capabilities out there with various vendors and organizations. And um, ensure that you're you know you've got regular you know updates and uh, you're regularly updating your passwords. Obviously that makes sense, but uh, should be a given that that's an ongoing every you know six, 30, 60, 90 days, whatever your policy needs to be within your organization, as well as the complexity. Limit the use of shared uh, accounts amongst users. Have an established process for onboarding new users. You know, check employee addresses for evidence that they they may be involved in breaches can also be something that is really good to look at. Um, the last one it really ties back to almost ties back into the documentation piece, which is around understand who within your organization is handling sensitive data, and have you know and have them trained on appropriate practices. Right, super important. Right, because you need to know who has access to the sensitive information and they need to know what's the best way to handle that information. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, knowing your managing your technology and people go hand in hand. So as much as you have all the di different technologies and tools in place, ensuring that your people are you know, cyber aware and have a cyber culture or security culture built within your business is also really critical. Um, so putting those two together is super important. Uh, next, I'm just going to touch on uh, the next phase, which is monitoring your progress. So now that you've got, you know, you've got your documentation updated, or hopefully you've got updated, you've got some technology and your know, people training and all that sort of stuff in place, the next thing you need to do is ensure that you're continually monitoring your progress. The one thing we have to keep in mind when we talk about security is that not it's not a one and done activity right to maintain protection once you've established uh, you've established practices that govern the security of your technology and people oh sorry to maintain protection <laughs> uh, once you've established practices that govern the security of the technology and people establish ongoing processes that address each and every one of these uh, areas so someone in your organization uh, needs to be responsible for staying up to date on cyber security threats a lot of organizations outsource this responsibility. So that could be um, to a partner, someone like us, that can abs absolutely fill in that uh, in that role in keeping the organization cybersecurity aware about threats, latest, you know, latest things that are out there in the market, trends, etc. Uh, ensure you have regular evaluation of the appropriateness of external partnerships, such as managed service providers, uh, outsourced managed service providers, or managed security service providers. Right? Uh, are they? Do they have the capability to manage your environment? Are they also a secure organization to do business with? Right? If you were to be audited, will they also stack up and be able to pass those particular audits and audit and compliance requirements that you may have? Right? These are now becoming more and more important. And we're seeing we're getting asked, you know, when we're working with organizations to provide a lot of uh, evidence of our security controls, policies, certification, et cetera. And that's probably becoming the, the more and more the norm to just to do business, 
All right, so that's also very, very uh, critical that you assess your partners. Um, evaluate your security pre preparedness to identify and prioritize specific risks for remediation. So you know, going back to the vulnerability management thing, it's that's something that's not a one time deal. You've constantly got to be scanning and looking for potential vulnerabilities to prioritize for remediation, right? Because things will always change. There's always new threats that will be coming out. Maybe your uh, applications and systems are perfect one day, and two weeks later, you may have a list of critical items that would, would appear on that report. But if you didn't continuously do something to review that, uh, you may be exposed. Um, and then conduct ongoing penetration testing, right? This is just a test for the appropriateness um, of your cyber defences. Are they still up to the task, similar to the previous item, right? Are your firewalls, are your WATs, web application files and, and things like that, are they, you know, up to date? Do they have the latest protection and services, right, to help protect your systems, right? These things are things that need to be ongoing. Uh, um, and then ensure that you have identified resources that will support you guys, support you in responding to a cyber attack. Right? This is also a, a very critical item on the list. Um, you know, there's a lot of times we ask or ask organizations, you know, if there was to be an event of a cyber attack, what's your plan? Do you have a documented process? Do you have a team? Who's going to be doing what? Nine times out of ten, the answer is, oh, yeah, it should be the IT guys will take care of this. And it's a bit, I would say, a bit loose and not really, you know, locked down and documented very well. If anything, this is something that needs to be, these are all something that needs to be addressed, you know, as part of the plan to help protect you guys as part of 2023. Document that who will be responsible for leading, not only from a troubleshooting perspective, but uh, who are you going to consult with? Are you going to consult with security, an external partner? Is there a comms plan in place? Who do you need to communicate with? There are, the next item there is, you know, understand who you need to notify as well in the event of a breach, right? So it's not just about internal comms to your to the internal business, but who else do you need to, to notify various authorities within your industry? Um, have you evaluated the appropriateness of standalone cyber insurance? So we get this a lot where, Customers might come to us and go, hey, we failed our, we can't get cyber insurance this year because we failed their, their questioning audits, et cetera. Um, we need to look at quickly implementing all these things, otherwise we can't get cyber insurance. That's becoming more and more, uh, we're seeing a lot more of that basically. Um, so ensuring that you have a plan, you have something like these issues that we're talking about today in place, whether it's in the works or about to happen, et cetera, um, will help you along that journey of A, obtaining cyber insurance, um, but also looking to, reduce your cyber insurance premiums because they seem to be always skyrocketing in the other direction. So ensuring you have a lot of these things covered will try and keep your costs down as well. Lastly, and most importantly as well, is make sure you're measuring your cybersecurity posture against industry standards right, and frameworks. Right? It sounds simple enough, but it's amazing how when we ask customers, so what are you aligned towards? And it's generally a loose responses you know we're we're kind of aligned to sort some things with NIST some things on essential eight some things yeah ISO and it's a little bit all over the place and they kind of just pick and choose what might suit that particular team or solution as to what they put in place so it's not really a standardized framework or structure um, so that becomes super important when you're looking to go down this path is you're standardized with a particular framework what you feel is right for your business and the risk profile of your business um, and work through that maturity level with that particular framework. Uh, as always, you need to stay up to date with those compliance and standards changes because it's always changing. So you need to ensure that you know, once you've got something in place, you have a way to be able to look at, okay, is this still up to date? Is there anything else I need to do to change to keep the security posture at the levels that we're, that we're happy to, to, uh, to maintain? Right, so there's a lot to cover off of talking through, you know, know your know your environment, manage your technology and people, and then ultimately monitor your progress. Um, you know, if this IT checklist is, yeah, sounds like a lot, that's because it's meant to. Even the security management has become, you know, more complex than ever. It's become more important than ever for, co for companies of every size, right? It's no longer just for the enterprise. It's for the small business and medium-sized businesses as well.
So on that note, uh, how do we help? I mean, at a, at a high level, uh, CBS, we have a dedicated security practice, right? With highly experienced and skilled uh, specialists. So this picture that you're seeing here is really just showing a security life cycle about how we go about helping our customers at any point in the security life cycle. Um, we generally start with most organizations with the top right, which is around assessments. So undertaking assessments across your environment or doing pen testing, for example. We then go through remediation exercises, whether it's a security uplift to remediate certain uh, vulnerabilities or just remediating various components in your, in your network, whether it could be solution updates or changes or upgrades and things like that. Right through into the next step, which is around monitoring and response. So a managed security service, whether that's like a SOC, Security Operations Center, um, or a managed vulnerability uh, server, vulnerability management service. Uh, we provide that, that capability to give you that peace of mind as a managed offering. And the last thing that uh, we look to do is the continuous improvement for around deepening the security posture. So raising security maturity as an ongoing uh, service. Right, so this is how we generally go about working with our customers. Some customers come in at various levels or want us to help in a particular area only. Um, absolutely, more than happy to do that as well. Um, so guys, if you if you aren't sure about anything that I spoke about today as part of the presentation, or you wanna you want some help or advice on you know where you guys are at within your your business, please reach out to myself, Diego, uh, or Travis, uh, and we'd be more than more than happy to help. Uh, over to you, Travis. Thank you, Adrian. Um, just a reminder, guys, if anyone's got any questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat. Adrian, there has been three questions asked so far if you'd like to have a quick look. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have various uh, security offerings. So I'm not going to go through them in detail, but we have seen significant uplift uh, from our customers, um, obviously over the past 12 months. Uh, this is, includes, but not limited to essential aid assessments, E5 uplifts, Azure security and configuration assessments, right through to managed detection and response in our SOC uh, and fully managed services. So to assist with budgets, uh, we do actually have access to Microsoft funded reviews. This is subject to Microsoft's requirements. So reach out if you'd like to discuss this and further information will be sent to you in the next 24 hours as part of the uh, post webinar email. Um, so that sort of brings us to the conclusion uh, of the checklist. Um, over to Q&A. Uh, Adrian, where would, Adrian and Diego, where would you like to start? You're on mute. Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. Um, oh, uh, uh, um, yeah, thank you for all the information. Uh, I, I would like to expand a bit on, yeah, I can see one of the questions about the, the strong passphrases and passwords. I, I think that, yeah, we need we need to consider at on these days that yeah is is not just one way to enter to your environment is before it was just a password when we always try to enforce it and make it better but i mean even if one person doesn't comply with this security policy and your password yeah your whole environment can be compromised that's why we just need just to see this from a whole as a whole and that's why also we need just to consider MFA, uh, conditional access policies, devices, policies, compliance. That's one of the ways that we can consider is the best approach instead of just focusing on one specific way to breach your environment. So, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, there are too many approaches in, in how you can handle passwords, you can create policies, but as Adrian said, I think one of the most important is to instruct your people, let them know what is a good and a healthy approach to all these cybersecurity threats. Um, yeah, I think that that's what I can expand on that one. Someone else want? Yeah, but that sounds add? good. Sounds good, Diego. There was another question straight after that one, actually, which was, you know, do we have a one a brief one pager of key points that will help me put a business case forward to our executive in order to get funding for a baseline cybersecurity audit? Absolutely. 
we have multiple, I guess, what we call one pages or brochures uh, for various security security audits. Uh, so yeah, we can share that with you, and Travis can probably take a note, and we can share that with um, with you on that. Um, uh, what's another question, Diego? Any in particular one that you you like to answer? <laughs> yeah, I can see. Yeah, through? yeah, I can see one here about yeah the risk and what happened with the with the cloud providers. I yeah, it's 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 certain that at, at this moment, yeah, no one can be. 100% sure that is, is not going to have vulnerabilities exposed, but that's why anyway, we as a companies, we as the person that who are creating and setting these controls, uh, yeah, need, need to be need to be aware what is happening. And in terms of, yeah, if you are using these providers, either cloud managed service, and, and other parties. Uh, that's why also the regulations and compliance start to play a big, big role. Because as you know, uh, Australian Cybersecurity Center and all the initiatives from the government have been pushing just to try to assess your environment, but also you just need just to assess your environment as what is exposed or what is also transferred to others. So, I mean, uh, I think that yeah, Azure, AWS, uh, they have been vulnerabilities at some point, but from our experience, they they're always going to be just very very committed to to fix. And for instance, on Microsoft, they have also a big big data ingestion and threat analysis and intelligence behind just getting signals from everywhere, from all the attacks of the consumer all the business and yeah that that is helping just to create this uh and i i think safety uh yeah safety feeling that that's what you need when you are just exposing you know, and working outside and yeah i think that, that makes yeah. sense makes sense diego that's really good um there's another question around how do we ensure that we are working with the right vendors who are offering their services with proper Security controls. Is there any recommendations on vendor security assessment? So that's I'm taking that as uh, choosing the right security partner. Would that be a first statement, guys? Travis and Diego, is that what that's sort of saying? Cho how to choose the right security vendor security assessment uh, vendor? So these are basically products or services and and those type of things. So. It's a difficult one because sometimes there are a lot of competing vendors out there that do similar things, right? So there's probably not a silver bullet that can easily say you should pick X vendor because of these reasons. Generally, there's a there's a multiple set of things that need to be looked at from a you know what systems do you have in place, what security products do you have in place, is there integration, is it uh, uh, what's the word? Do you already have some sort of vendor stack that actually can just keep expanding to sort of limit the the number of different vendors you have been having in your environment so i guess when we're approaching this scenario we're doing we, we try to simplify and reduce the number of vendors that are involved in a security solution for our customers as to as few as possible uh, but then we look at capability what's in place you know are they on the right path as far as you know the gartner quadrant, you know, they're not probably like at the bottom disappearing into the ether and those type of things. Um, and that's how we kind of guide customers through choosing the right product or service. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, adding to that one, I think that, yeah, that's also part of the compliance regulations and that's why people got certified, uh, trying to prove that they, they can just do better in this certain area. Right, but sure. I, I think that yeah, at the moment the the government is is has a very good initiatives, just to help all the companies to yeah to go on the good path when you can just start creating and setting some controls, including yeah how you can assess what is going to be your best decision. Uh, but yeah, pretty much that is rely on your processes, on the information that you have. And if you have already a partner, you can just rely on 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 them. Oh, yeah, we always, as as a, yeah, as a company that is going to be helping, 
anyone interested in in update their security, yeah, we can just provide more information on what is what is all the regulation and frameworks behind. Fantastic. Um, I've also had another question in relation to how do you go about monitoring the dark web for cred credentials sold? So this would be more of a, um, I guess, third party product, um, but um, over to you guys. I think that yeah, this can be, yeah, you can use different, different third parties. But also using what is now the SIM, the security information management, and you try to get this one pane of glass for all your security alerts. You can connect different services, third party services, paid services, or you can simply just connect to the Australian cybersecurity cities when they are just giving you all the identities of compromise and also, yeah, all the threat intelligence. And that is going to feed all your environment with the latest, including the dark web monitoring. I think that's that sounds that's good. It. Any other questions out there? Those ones, uh, do we do work with small banks? I saw something. Can you give me some insight into the scope of your work with small banks? So, yeah, we do do a lot with, uh, I guess, in the mutual sector, if that's what you consider a small bank. Um, we have a lot of references in that account. I'm sure Travis is probably more than happy to share <laughs> some of the references and the type of work we do, because I see that you've got, um, you also said, what's the scope of your work with small banks? So, I mean, at a high level, a lot of those banks, we look after end-to-end -end IT management, so managed services, so infrastructure, service desk, those type of things. Um, vulnerability management as a service. We provide uh, SOC, managed SOC, to some of the smaller banks as well. I would say we probably provide a, a, a large range of solutions, cloud computing as well with our private cloud or with Azure, for example. So uh, I would say with a small banking sector, we do a our scope is quite large. It's our, actually our strongest referenceable industry at CBS. So we're more than happy to share, and I'm sure Travis can, you know, reach out to you and provide you some more context there. Yeah, I'll reach out to Jim. I'll reach out to you um, post post this meeting. Um, what else is there? For transparency. See, oh, here we go. <laughs> um, how do you extend checks to ensure your managed service partners are also secure? This is from Stephen Hemsworth. So how do you extend checks to ensure your managed service providers are also secure? So I mean, that's probably coming back to when we're getting, um, it's probably a question about how we get audited on behalf of our customers. So we, we ensure that we have the relevant certification and accreditation within the various industries um, to ensure that we can provide the services to our customers. Most of our customers are heavily regulated, so they're either in the financial services industry, uh, healthcare, non-for-profit and government sectors. So we probably work in, you know, the most heavily regulated industries, you know, in the market. Um, so we have a lot of these uh, certifications, accreditation. We can provide all the, you know, attestations that you guys, that businesses require. Uh, and we have our internal head of compliance and governance, who in a lot of cases actually helps us lead and engage with those organizations to share content or show evidence of how we you know provide a secure service to our customers uh, so i hope that's uh that's answered the question there for you Stephen. Uh, and i think that looks that looks like it but oh, awesome um anything else guys or oh i think that yeah just just a quick summary and the yeah, quiz recommendation uh, yeah um, there are different ways to yeah to be on these days um securing your environment uh, for us yeah sometimes just starting for uh, assessment uh uplift on remediation and help you to monitoring on on this cycle because as yeah always we have said this is a cycle that needs to keep happening the training penetration testing reassess recertification um, i think that yeah the most important and what we have been really helpful for or our clients is that you need to pick your quick wins you need just to see what is your whole 
panorama, how your whole view of your yeah, current threats or current vulnerabilities. And yeah, you need just to pick what are the easiest, what are the most effective, but also what is going to cost less and impacting less to your operation. And that's why, yeah, a partner can help you to develop a security roadmap. And yeah, little by little with these quick wins, as we mentioned, we're going to be able to raise your security posture yeah, as, as you want. Yeah, that's awesome. great, great point there, Diego. Start small and then go big. So it's definitely a strategy that a lot of businesses have adopted. So um, yeah, nice little point there. Thanks, Diego. Perfect. Well, um Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Diego. Uh, if there's no more questions, um, really just like to thank you uh, for your time again. Uh, if there's any further information you require, feel free to reach out to one of us or um, any or your account manager at Canon Business Services. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank, thank you, guys. Very much. Pleasure. Bye.